Hello and welcome. My name's Kat Ellinger and I'm an author, editor and critic. And this is 1959's Room at the Top, a breakthrough British film, one of the or widely considered one of the first films in the British New Wave, a film that really changed concepts of what British film could be about in a time when the British film industry was considered rather stagnant and old-fashioned. It was a film that really opened the door for other films in the new wave, including those made by Woodfall Productions, and so therefore a very, very important film, based on the best-selling novel by John Brain, and of course I'll be talking all about that as this commentary goes along. There is so much to unpack with this film. I wanted to kick off, though, by quoting or reading the opening of an essay that Pauline Kael wrote for Film Quarterly in 1961, summing up her thoughts on the British New Wave, because I think if we think of the British New Wave in terms of aesthetics, we think of the New Wave in terms of a certain ambiance. This opening scene really sets that up. We've seen him on the train going past these industrial landmarks. It's very gloomy. And on top of that, we've got that very doom-laden score as well. And a shot now of the Browns factory, which, of course, is Mr. Brown is going to become a very, very important person within the narrative. Well, in fact, all of the Browns, including Susan, who is a key member of the love triangle that develops. But looking at this article by Pauline Kale called Commitment in the Straitjacket, she wrote, The new look in English films is reality. The streets, the factories, the towns, houses and backyards of grim, modern, industrialised England. The young English authors and directors are striking at social problems of every type. But the backgrounds, the environment show us a larger theme. The ugliness, the fatalism, the regimentation of daily life. In Hollywood in the 30s, Warner Brothers produced the socially conscious gangster and depression melodramas that starred Paul Mooney, James Cagney, Edward G. Robinson. Viewed today, most of those films don't look like much. But they were an angry reaction to the frustrations, poverty and injustices of the 30s and they had tremendous impact at the time. The English movie making should now become just about the most socially conscious in the world is amazing when you consider that, as the critic director Tony Richardson put it, it's a frightening and disturbing comment on British democracy that certain institutions, the monarchy, the army, the church, the public school, the prisons, the police, are guarded from any candid presentation with as hard and tough iron curtain as the Russian bloc has ever imposed. How can you produce social criticism when you can't criticise the official organs of power? You look at the way people live. I think it's somewhat ironic, actually. We just missed a very, very young Prunella Scales. We just missed a very, very young Wendy Craig who in the opening shot there. Two actresses who became icons of British comedy on television. Uh, I think it's ironic that I'm now going to talk about this this sense of grimness that Kale talks about. Because we take so much for granted now. We're used to seeing this kind of look associated with British film. But at the time, it... I mean, it's easy to just underestimate how different that was to the things that people were used to seeing. And it is a grim film. It's shot in Bradford on location apart from the scenes like these in the studio down in Shepparton. And I have a quote I want to read later from Simone Signore, actually, on the north and south divide in England and how she found those two experiences, because I think... Uh, Signore's words lend some some really interesting weight to the conversation of the North and South Divide. But when this film came along, it really was something new. And because of the success of it, it opened the door for financing other pictures like it. So things like Don't Look Back in Anger, Saturday Night, Sunday Morning, Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner, you know, 
all of the the key new wave pictures that came out of that it gave producers and distributors a i guess a marketing point to say well basically you know this film did very well it was it was oscar nominated it won these two oscars signore won the oscar patterson won the the writer the writer of the screenplay won an oscar for his adaptation of brain's novel and so it, it made the the idea of the british quote-unquote social problem picture marketable in hollywood terms which was really really important really important for british film and it kind of injected a new energy into british film that hadn't been seen before i mean if you compare this and i do want to explore this a little bit later on to other key pitches in the new wave there are a lot of differences to be found in room at the top and i i really want to talk about some of those in detail but it's it does set down some it does set down some of the i don't want to say formula but some of the defining themes i guess of that era and type of cinema uh, but it wasn't approached as a new wave film. Jack Clayton was just very interested in the story. If you look at his other films, they it follows some of the same themes that crop up in those films. And, you know, he was just interested in this story about people. Or Joe Lampton, who we've met. I've not introduced anybody yet, but we've got Joe Lampton there, played by Lawrence Harvey with his friend there who actually in John Brains's book Charlie Soames is a background character he's a character that Lampton remembers from his town from his previous town that he talks a lot about so when we hear about Charlie we hear about him in the past tense or there is a scene actually when they get together or a couple of scenes where they get together but he's a peripheral figure and the script here brings him into so he's more of a comrade he's there in the present moment played by donald houston and we also saw back there there's some interesting casting in this film actually because some of the people like the leads people like heather sears and lawrence harvey weren't especially experienced at the time but then in the in the more supporting cast, we have people like Raymond Huntley, played Mr. Hoylake, the boss, who we meet again later on. Or we have people like Donald Wolfitt as the old man Brown. And, and even people like Hermione Badley, who turns up as Elspeth, the friend to the Alice Acegill character. All very solid British character actors, and there's some really, really good, solid casting around the the whole, you know, the supporting cast. And talking of the casting, actually, I mean, there's an interesting casting history to this. Some of it rather quite scandalous, but it was produced by John and James Wolfe, who were the brains behind. Romulus and then it's Umbrella Remus Productions. And as Tony Olgate states in his essay that he did on Reem at the Top for a book called The Cinema in Britain and Ireland, edited by Roy Ward Baker, of all people, uh, they said that John and James Wolfe were two highly respected producers. John Wolfe, the business brain in the partnership, was also an influential figure at the British Film Producers Association and served on its executive council in the 1950s and 60s. He was, for instance, a member of its high-powered delegation to see the BBFC in March 1955 over the question of ex-certificate films and the matter of pre-production censorships of scripts. James 
James Wolfe worked for publicity for Universal in Hollywood before the Second World War and returned to Hollywood at the war's end to join Columbia. He had the flair for production more commonly found there than in Britain. And I think Oldgate makes this a really important point because the thing that he highlights in the opening to this piece, which I'll be quoting from a little bit later on as well because he goes right into the history of censorship and how this film... Uh, how the BBFC viewed this film and some of the cuts that they had to make. It gives a very, very in-depth report of that. But he makes a very interesting point saying that the Wolves started their own company in 1948. So they brought with them that, first of all, they carried quite a lot of weight in the British film industry. They were truly, truly independent as well. But they were coming to the scene with a kind of Hollywood experience behind them as well. So they were looking th- looking at film in terms of b- business and commercial. And as Oldgate points out, this puts them completely, you know, contrasts them to people like Tony Richardson and people like John Osborne, who founded Woodfall, who basically shaped and defined the British New Wave, as it were, because these were two people who had come from the theatre, so they were looking at things in completely, completely, completely different terms. And so what you had with the Wolves was, you know, they they were able to back up the idea of making British film with a more of a a, a business-orientated model. And they wanted to be making adult films. And I'll talk a little bit when I talk about censorship. Heather C. So I haven't been able to introduce anybody at all because I've been... To- I'm like, there was just so much to go into with this. But the Wolves were basically, you know, looking at this as a commercial venture, but they were also looking to reshape British film. And they had this weight behind them. So that sets them out from the other producers in the new wave. We were looking at it from a more theatrical, I guess, artistic point of view. That's not to say Room at the Top is not an artistic film, because it totally is. Jack Clayton at this point was working, director Jack Clayton was working as an associate producer with them. He'd made several shorts for them as well, including the bespoke Overcoat in 1959, which won won an Oscar for him. And so it really was coming to get, like this coming together of these these great talents and these minds to take a gamble and make something that was just very different to the film that we'd seen before, something very adult, something very sexually frank. And, you know, with all due respect to my fellow con- countrymen, the us British are not really known for our sexual frankness, and we certainly weren't in the 1950s if we're not now. So I think, you know, to take that chance and then to be taken seriously as well, you know, it it, it was a well-calculated move on the point of the wolves. They'd actually gone for Don't Look Back in Anger, actually, and lost out in that, and so snatched up the rights to... John Brain's Room at the Top, which had been widely successful. It was a huge big seller. It had been serialised in the popular press as well. Had a a great load of weight behind it in and of itself. And so they brought the rights up for £5,000. And that's how that came about. But I wanted to talk a little bit about casting. Because uh, when you read about the casting, I mean, Neil Sinyard, who was Jack Clayton, or is, sorry... Is he still with us? Uh, he he wrote the official biography on or the the main biography on Jack Clayton. Has written about the film several times. He's done, in fact, done his own commentary on this film as well. And he often points to the fact that Lawrence Harvey was perfect casting for. The role, just because of his persona that he had in real life, he was a Lithuanian Jewish man who had started working as a theatre actor in London. He'd attended RADA for a semester or whatever and went off out into the working world, got himself under contract 
to Romulus and, and Remus and basically had a, a presence in cinema but hadn't really broken through, hadn't really made his mark and he was actually nominated for an Academy Award for his performance in this. So there's a lot of talk about that and you hear that story. Uh, the fact that Sinyard also said that Clayton thought that Lawrence Harvey was perfect for the role because he was kind of like Joe Lampton in real life. He was opportunistic, he was a go-getter, he... And if you read a celebrity kind of comments or memoirs about him, a lot of them, quite sadly, don't have very nice things to say about him. Simone Signal Ray does, so she absolutely loved working with him. And she talks about him in, in her autobiography. But a lot of people felt that he couldn't act. You know, the critics weren't particularly very nice about him in his previous work. A lot of actors, you know, just thought he was a bit pushy and shovey. And Jack Clayton thought that he was great for the role because he was like this. You know, he wanted to get ahead. He wanted to get to the top. And he was going to take whatever means necessary. Now, John Fraser's account, uh, star... John Fraser's account adds rather more colour to this version of events because, I mean, we only have John Fraser's word for this. This is not something that's been widely reported, but John Fraser, who was an actor, wrote this very, very scandalous sort of tell-all memoir about the British film industry a few years ago and it really was you know the kind of memoirs that we crave to read it's all very very nice and wow getting a memoir of some star and uh you know peter cushing's like this as much as i love peter cushing he was just such a polite man that when you read his memoir it's kind of like such and such oh they were just lovely to work with and this person was lovely to work with and this person was marvelous and this person was professional and it just goes with that kind of persona of somebody who is just very polite and, and professional but but you're reading this and you're thinking i want the juice i want the scandal well john fraser wrote this book called close up an actor telling tales which which really delivers all that so it's important to say that this might not necessarily be true. This is what John Fraser said, though. And, uh, you know, he was really gloves off. I mean, one of the quotes was, uh, said the billboard outside Odeon Cinema, Leicester Square, said, Michael Redgrave and Dirk Bogart in the sea shall not have them. Passing by, Noel Coward said, I don't see why not everybody else has. So this is, this is what we're talking about. He talked about closeted bisexuality. He talked about homosexuality, a lot about Dirk Bogart, who, of course, famously had to spend most of his career in the closet. But he had some very, very choice things to say about Lawrence Harvey. And I feel rather unfair reading these out. But I think if you take that into the context of what Jack Clayton said about Lawrence Harvey being Joe Lampton, and if we consider that these might possibly be true, it does definitely lend some some more colourful context to what was going on here. But he said the British star Lawrence Harvey was a whore, and that was one of the things that he said. And he also suggested that basically John Harvey was having some sort of relationship with the producer, with producer uh, James Wolfe. And he, the, so reading a quote from that, he basically said, it was well known in the business that Jimmy Wolfe was in love with Lawrence Harvey. He put his protege into film after film, all of which had flopped until he bought the film's rights to John Brain's bestseller, Room at the Top, contracted the great Simone Signore to play opposite Harvey and finally made his lover a star. But Harvey kept marrying to further his career. Larry's whoredom was so blatant it was disarming. As a teenager, he started out living with Hermione Badley, and we'll meet her a little bit later on. A blowsy star of intimate review more than twice his age. Then he married Margaret Layton, old enough to be his mother, but a woman of style. 
And when this marriage was over, he married Joan Cohn, widow of the managing director of Columbia Studios. And throughout all those career marriages, he still managed to string Jimmy Wolf along. Now, this gives us some interesting insight. You know, we talk about the casting couch and we talk about actresses kind of sleeping their way to the top. But, you know, is this a case that Lawrence Harvey was doing the same thing? And if so, how much does that make him Joe Lampton? Because Joe Lampton in... And unfortunately, you know, 20 minutes have flown by and I haven't had time. There's a lot to analyse here as well and I'm kind of missing it. Joe Lampton does does just that. He sleeps his way to the top because we have, within the book as well, we get the benefit of his internal monologue. So we get to know a lot more about how unscrupulous he was. And in one way, Lawrence Harvey gives a much more sympathetic view of a, of a character who is still, at the end of the day, highly unsympathetic. I have seen certain comments or reviews that have talked about Lawrence Harvey's performance in this. is kind of one-dimensional. And, you know, you get people point, well, he wasn't a great talent, he wasn't a great actor, and, you know, and... There were certain, I guess, uh, criticisms of his accent as well. Neil Sinyard points that out in an article that he did, people calling him phony. John Brain was apparently outraged when he heard that Harvey had, had taken the role. He didn't think he was right for it, but changed his opinion when he, when he saw the actual performance. But and, and, it, and I'll say this right out now, his accent... Is is not that great. Uh, we'll talk about accents a little bit later on in the in the dialect and everything. So accent isn't that great. But it, it it does well enough. But he still has that very theatrical English speaking voice behind him. You know that kind of seeps through as well. So uh, you have that. But then you, if you look at the character of Joe Lampton, he is very one dimensional. He is very shallow. When we listen to his inner thoughts in the book, he's somebody who just obsesses over money and prestige and status and getting his way. He's very angry. He's very vengeful. He's very resentful that he's considered lower class. And, you know, he's just driven and motivated by basically just by this idea of climbing the ladder. And so he doesn't have a lot of layers. I mean, we see a few layers in the film. And, and the film really does take a bit of a more sensitive approach towards this character. Because in the book, he's thoroughly, thoroughly unlikable, even by the end. And at least we get to see some of his vulnerability through Harvey's performance. And we get to kind of like him, if not like him, maybe, I wouldn't even say sympathise, but maybe relate to. We can kind of relate to him, he's a flawed person. And so if we take all this into consideration and the way that he looks at Susan and in the way that he sees Susan the first time way back, you know, about 10 minutes ago, when he sees her getting out of the car, he doesn't just see Susan, he sees the car and the guy that's with her who's rich and he wants to be that guy. He wants to have those status symbols. So he's, he's really, really objectifying Susan as a status symbol, as a representation of a lifestyle or entry into a lifestyle, um, entry into a many society that he feels entitled to. And I think... You know, if we take that into consideration and we look at Lawrence Harvey and we consider for five minutes that maybe what John Fowler said was true, then this makes it absolutely wonderful, the fact that he's stringing along this producer and lying through his teeth and getting involved with these women and he's, you know, hustling here and hustling there. Basically, to get what he wants out of life, it makes him the perfect person to play. Joe Lampton, because he is Joe Lampton. And that was something that Jack Clayton had seen and, and Jack Clayton, why Jack Clayton thought that he would be perfect for that role. Although originally he hadn't been first choice, it was meant for Stuart Granger and Gene Simmons. 
to do together. And Alice, originally, according to David Thompson, was going to be played, or Vivian Lee was actually originally offered the part. And then Simone Signoret ended up with the part. And originally, the film was going to be directed by Peter Glenville, and then Jack Clayton took over. We see what we see here is this opening up of two very, very distinct worlds. And this is something that is echoed throughout the film. We see Joe several times being told by the people around him, she's not for you, that's not for you, lad. And of course, there's some of that in the book, but it, it seems to be exaggerated for, to the, for the film so that almost everybody around Joe Lampton is constantly reminding him of the fact that his face doesn't fit. Interestingly as well, another one of the key changes from the book is, you know, we don't have the Charlie Soames character. He's not camping out in bedsit land with a friend. He actually goes to stay, and I haven't talked about the geography actually, the top, which is the perfect metaphor for this idea of those at the top of the hill, are more affluent and rich, and at the top, the very top, we get the millionaires, and then down the bottom, you know, it goes down the social scale. Joe Lampton actually gets himself digs at the top, or somewhat in the middle of the top. He's not at the top of the top, and he wants to go to the top of the top. He wants to go to the Browns. But from the beginning of the book, he's introduced as meeting his new landlady, becomes a lodger for these Thompson characters who become almost like a, a family to him. And there's a lot about his landlady and they've lost a son to the war. Huge war themes, which I haven't managed to mention as well. And so he becomes almost a surrogate son. And that gives him his way into the thespians and into this very middle class world. Uh, the change in the film makes it less understandable that he's well, he's not exactly accepted, but the way he manages to get in. But it does then justify his rage. I want to talk about the wonderful George uh, Aesgill there. We don't see a lot from him, but he is just such such a real sinister character played by another theatrical heavyweight, Alan Cuthbertson. And the way that he treats Alice, and he really is a, a bully. There's a lot of misogyny in this film as well. Alice, no matter how free she is, lives in a very misogynistic world where she is basically a kept woman as well. And she's reminded, and we find out later on, that she came to him penniless. And she's basically this kept woman, so she has to go through this humiliation. And I especially like the way that the shots of him are framed because you always see him standing up in the dominant position. We see this repeated when he goes to see Joe Lampton at his work later on. And so he's he's kind of looking down in a, in a, in a sinister manner and he's a guy not to be messed with. That's something that is a change from the book because he's not as much of a bullish character in that. And I'll, I'll, explore that or go into that in more depth when we meet him uh, a little bit later on i said earlier on that this is has some distinct differences to the new wave and it does. I mean, it's the first in then a line of pictures. But the one thing that singles it out as somewhat different is the fact that it exists in these dual worlds. And the novel as well exists completely in this kind of bourgeois world. And we only see Joe when he goes back to his council estate and things where he's come from. It's mainly set with the, with the, the Thompsons and the Thespians and the film follows that film follows that same line of thinking this little wave here is is such an iconic moment for the film and this is incidentally how he remembers her they use that in a flashback mode for the sequel 1965's life at the top starring lawrence harvey and a lot of the original cast 
but that's how he remembers them we, when we get to see Joe Lampton and how he's turned out. So, you know, this is the one thing that sets it apart because when we look at the, the films of Woodfall, say, and things like Saturday Night, Sunday Morning, The Taste of Honey, they are set distinctly in working class worlds and that's what made them so different. They are in distinctly working class, impoverished worlds and we get to see quote unquote normality and normal life for working people and this is slightly detached from that we see glimpses of it we see the snooker hall the dog track we see his aunt's house and the bombed estate that he's come from where he lost his parents but the bulk of the story is set in this very middle class affluent world so that's one of the things that sets it out it's slightly different from the films that come after it. This scene here, there's so many scenes and they're so quick, but they're so dense, they're so rich in information. Clayton does not mess around at all. It, like we saw before with George coming into the pub, it's like a minute and a half, but so much is conveyed in that one scene about the state of his marriage to, to Alice and what's going on. And the same here in this scene. You know, it kind of flits along. The scenes are all very, very short. And it's got quite a frenetic pace to it. And I think that that mirrors the... Because the book is all from Lampton's point of view. And the film is slightly less about his point of view. It tries to give a more objective view of the story. But it is still about him. He's in every scene. It's about his world, his life. I think this flitting goes to show his inner state of mind, you know, because when he's with with Susan, he's in love with Susan. When he's with Alice, he's, he's in love with Alice. And it's kind of all over the place. And that's reflected in the way that it's edited, the way that the action just moves on and on and on and on and on very, very quickly until we get to this dramatic build-up at the end very dense so much conveyed in in so many of these scenes so one way it does set the bar for the new wave is joe is this sexual predator he is a new breed of man who would inspire people like later on michael Caine's alfie or the knack and how to get it and even saturday night sunday morning which came just after this this idea of promiscuous young men playing the not to get married game or to get married game manipulating women opening up the dialogue of how young men spoke about sex and how they navigated sexual relationships under pressure of these traditional concerns about settling down. And it really does, Joe Lampton becomes a prototype for somebody later on like Alfie. Alfie, again, was a very, very self-motivated, selfish person, who, but his motivation was sex and the status brought from sex, whereas Joe Lampton's end game is money and marriage. And you see... I, to go back to what I said before, the way he's just totally dismissed by Jack in every scene. And Jack is, you know, and again, different to the character that we see in in the book, played by John Westbrook in a wonderful, wonderful performance. He He's a nicer character in the book, and he doesn't really, really hate joe lampton in the book it seems more like paranoia and jealousy on joe lampton's behalf whereas in the film he's almost like a caricature the way that he dismisses him there's so much of the unspoken in this as well the way he kind of cuts him off and he's patronizing and he dismisses him it's really a wonderful wonderful performance of that character but it's been highly exaggerated so the it makes joe lampton slightly more sympathetic it makes him the underdog the person we want to root for because you know like i said in the in the novel he's not particularly sympathetic and a lot of his rage a lot of his inner rage and a lot of his the way that he sees the people around him it sort of comes from this selfish sense of narcissism, and so it's very, very hard to relate to him. <laughs> 
And the way that Neil Patterson is adapted, and I agree with Simone Signoret. I mean, the book is very, very interesting for its time, and it has its moments, definitely. And without the book, we wouldn't have the film. But I think this is one of the cases of the, the film being better than the book, and Simone Signoret said that. You know, she read the book, she thought it wasn't a great piece of literature, it wasn't this master piece of literature, but it was a very interesting story, and it is. It's a very interesting story, and and one that was so untypical for the time as well, and one that obviously earned John Brain the moniker of one of the first angry young men of that generation. So, you know, that's important to remember, but... I think the changes that Patterson has made, and some of them are huge, and some of them are more subtle, work towards making the Lambton character slightly more sympathetic, slightly more, you know, you, you get to see the, the troubles that he has to face. And, of course, he fa this scene happens in the book where Hoylake comes to him and he basically says, look, Mr. Brown is an influential man and you're not going to do this. And it's done in this very, very British way where he's saying one thing, but he's meaning something completely different because we like to do that. And nobody's really up front. It's all very, very passive aggressive. And in the insinuation, and this, of course, would be something that people like Harold Pinter would just turn into a sublime art form in as a playwright later on so we get that in the book but in the film then we also get jack wales dismissing him we get the humiliation we get the a slightly more aggressive approach to you know you you don't belong here your face doesn't fit whereas in the book he he, he blends in slightly and manages to get his way in because of his relationship with the Thompsons, with these people that he's lodging with. And the fact that they take him over as a surrogate son of some sort, so he obviously miss their son from the war, and he apparently one of the first things is he notices a photograph of their son and there's a distinct likeness. And so he's able to ingratiate himself in more easily, and so you don't... You don't get a lot of the aggression towards him and belittlement that you see in the film. And I think that you need to see that because without his inner monologue, you know, the character in and of itself, just to be after many, it's not enough. You have to see why he has this resentment and why he feels like he does and why he's so angry because his anger speaks for a generation of post-war young men who came out of the war after sacrificing everything to a decimated country and culture was changing the post-war generation is coming up to the 50s and 60s especially of young people completely and it was the same in america completely revolutionized cu culture they didn't want the same things as their fathers they didn't want the early marriage and the settling down they suddenly you know rock and roll was on the horizon things were changing all of a sudden what they wanted i'm talking about working class people was uh, what they wanted was the money and the women and the lifestyle and so everything was was changing and i think that this film even though it's set and the book is set still in rationing in the rationing period like straight after the war it's set slightly earlier it speaks to that generation of you know why should we have to put up with this why should i have to go and work in a factory where my father worked and my grandfather worked until i die why can't i have some of that and so it speaks for that generation and then of course in 1966 we get alfie the poster boy for that generation and albert finney's character in saturday night sunday morning is another great example of that someone who's very angry and frustrated and just wants to have sex with women and he doesn't want to be under all this pressure and he don't, you know, and you feel it, you just feel this rage. And I think, you know, the changes to this, they really, 
they really help you get on board with that. Changing the subject now, we talked earlier about this grim setting, what Pauline Kael said. And I talked about, again, to go back to what I said about this being slightly different from the new wave, because there are scenes of ugliness in this, and we do see the real Bradford and the real Halifax in these and real locations. We do see that real world, but then other parts of it are very, very stylized in a way that the pictures in the new wave weren't. And this scene especially is so reminiscent of noir and especially when you take into account the score scored by mario nassim bene who was native italian started off with people like rossellini went over to the states he was hugely prolific composer did over 150 films and soundtracks but scoring things like the barefoot contessa mankiewicz's barefoot contessa but Richard Fleischer's The Vikings, Solomon and Sheba as well from 1959. And the score for this has that very Hollywood dramatic quality to it. The, the It is another thing that keeps it out of step with what the British New Wave would become. But it does place it then back with American film into something more akin to something like the doom love that you find in a film like Nicholas Ray's In a Lonely Place, that same. And, and of course, with Freddie Francis's beautiful, beautiful cinematographer, it, cinematography is wow those scenes those love scenes it becomes so moody and so stylized and of course one of the things that became the aesthetic for the british new wave and i'm talking about this as the most realistic part uh, happens to come up you know contrast to that really st stylization we get something akin to neorealism here the bombed out city and what had become of britain because like i said this is supposed to take place in immediately after the post-war period and we see him returning to his roots is and 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 starting to realize he doesn't really belong there anymore he's not recognized he's recognized as somebody now with many because of his his suits but you know freddie francis such a, a great cinematographer obviously won two Academy Awards for Sons and Lovers the years after this and, and Glory in 1989. Interesting figure as well. He always fascinates me because he had these two lifestyles, these two different careers. One is a cinematographer where he started actually at Talking Pictures, which became Ealing, as a focus puller and on the clapperboard and really worked his, his way up into cinematography and you know is responsible for some really key key films especially key british films so he went on i talked about saturday night sunday morning which was uh, 1960 uh, to film that and he worked again with jack clayton on the innocence and that's all about ambiance talk about stylized ambience that we saw in the previous scene with the shadows and just the way it's lit and the, just the amazing kind of Rembrandt lighting. I mean, the innocence is, is all about that. He did things like The Elephant Man and The French Lieutenant's Woman and the remake of Cape Fear in 1991. But then on the flip side of that, he also worked as a director in horror film working for people like Hammer and Amicus, and actually turned out some really, really interesting horror films, things like The Eve of Frankenstein and Nightmare for Hammer and Hysteria, some of their, their more kind of thriller things. And Amicus, their portmanteau films like Dr. Terror's House of Horrors, he did The Skull, which is like a bit of a weird uh, Marquis de Sade thing, and The Psychopath, which is like a... Proto Jarro and things like the Deadly Bees, Torture Garden, and then back to Hammer. Dracula is risen from the grave. He did Trog. He did one of the sleaziest, weirdest British independent fe uh, kind of crossover genre features: Mummy, Nancy, Nanny, Sunny, and Gurley as well, and the Creeping Flesh. So he had like these two different alter egos. One is a very, very stylistic and professional cinematographer, and then the, the other is this director of low budget horror admittedly very interesting low budget horror because it was freddie francis they're coming together of him and jack clayton 
in these two films, Room at the Top and The Innocence, are some of the best work coming out of Britain uh, at that time. And there was, a, a, I guess, a kind of kindred spirit as well because Clayton was also somebody who sort of worked his way up in the industry as well. So there's a kind of an understanding between the two. We now see his his home, this tiny little terrace kitchen, which, you know, this is more in keeping with the true British new wave where we see these tiny little terrace homes and, and, and things like that. Beatrice Varley playing the the aunt there, who again has a bigger presence in the book. We see their suspicion of this this don't sell yourself out for silver lad, you know, you go for, for love and she's concerned. This distrust of the many classes and this other side of the class division. We can see where his resentment has grown from because there is a lot of suspicion of, of people with money and authority in the establishment in the working classes. Simone Signore, in her wonderful autobiography, Nostalgia Isn't What It Used To Be, talked about filming in Bradford. Uh, and obviously, these were is shot in Shepparton. And she said, in Bradford, two people liked us. It was the first time the town had served as a background for something other than boring documentaries about wall combing. The people of the upper top paid no attention to us and their fortresses never really did open for us. No doubt they had read the book. By contrast, the houses in the working class quarters were wide open for us. I remember two nights of filming during which the kettles never seemed to cease boiling in the beautifully clean little kitchens. The people of Bradford, these in any case, were gay and full of humour. I was discovering the north of England. The rest of the world wasn't far behind me. Most of the people who revolutionised the cultural and artistic life of Britain during those years, the angry young men and their contemporaries who waged war on the establishment came from the north. When we came down to London to do the studio shooting, I became aware of this fact, but my three weeks in Yorkshire had prepared me well. And she talks about how there was a sense when she went to... London, how different it was. There's just the money on display, how well the city said when she first visited London in 1947 to film Against the Wind, because this wasn't Signore's first British film. It was still a bombed out place, suffering from the war, and it was, you know. But when she goes back, sort of 12 years later, to film this, she sees it's changed and it's completely rebuilt, whereas the North hasn't. And there's always been a North and South. I mean, it is with any country. I mean, if you look at North America as well, the North and South there with the, you know, the different identities of those those parts. In Britain, it's more condensed because obviously we're a small island, but there is definitely this thing where opportunity and affluence are linked with the South. There's more service jobs here. There's more professional jobs. Where in the, whereas the North was, was very, very industrial and therefore more working class. And it was something that Signore actually saw, but this was something that we were seeing truly, properly, and how those two worlds clash and how those two worlds contrast, we see now with the Brown residents and how different that is to where he is in this seedy little bed set. It opened up the conversation about those two worlds and what it meant to be working class and this idea of social mobility. Although he achieves the social mobility, it's like, at what cost? At what cost does he achieve that social mobility? And we see that in the sequel, which was also based on a book by John Brain, in that he he really has to, I guess, compromise himself and give up all his principles to exist in this world. And it really is no triumph, no prize, where it is quite depressing. We have this idea of social mobility in Britain, but it rarely exists. It's very hard to be socially mobile if you are on, from a working class background. And he, and you know, that was especially true in the post-war period and still true today, even though there are some commentators who 
swear we live in a classless society that simply isn't true and if you have a regional accent and you don't speak the received pronunciation and your people aren't the right people and you didn't go to the right schools certain opportunities are just not there for you and this is one of the first films to really really i mean british class is all over and the class system is all over british film and neil Sinyard actually makes a made a really really interesting observation in in the, comparing this to Charles Dickens' Great Expectations, where you have this lower class figure called Pip, who is climbing the social ladder thanks to a mysterious benefactor, but he still has this anger, this class resentment, and he still meets a certain sense of snobbery. And it's a very astute observation, but it shows that this is something that existed in Dickens' time, and it definitely existed in the 50s, and it still exists now. And in terms of cinema, this is one of the first films to really open that up. And then, consequently, the other British New Wave films really started to talk about the working classes and their lives and the sort of things that they were facing. Very normal, ordinary things, whereas Joe Lampton's quest perhaps isn't that ordinary and normal. But it started to talk about a class in, in a really meaningful way, which was necessary because class is so much part of the British cultural identity. And it was something that people needed to see. And I think that's why it resonated so much with people, especially that generation. You had a generation of the working classes that were changing the notion of what it meant to be working class. And that came through actors like later on Michael Caine, through Stanley Baker, through the Alan Bates, through the British New Wave, through pop music and bands like the Beatles. You know, there's a whole culture change about to happen that comes in that post-war period. But yet, despite that, we still hold on to certain institutions and, it, and it's very, very hard without completely selling yourself out to be out working class and proud, but yet socially mobile as well. It's something we still haven't quite grasped over here, whereas, you know, America still has a class system, but it's orientated around money. The British class system is all to do with breeding. You can be upper class and totally penniless and still accepted as one of the upper classes you can be working class and a millionaire and not be accepted. And I think that's something that this film opens up, and especially the sequel as well really looks into that as well, where he's still an underdog, and under, he's underfoot, he's under the, the Brown's cosh in the sequel, and he's under, he's got, Mr Brown's got his foot on his neck, and he's largely compromised. The wonderful Hermione Badley, he nominated for an Oscar for his supporting role, and I think it was the shortest ever supporting role ever to be nominated for an Oscar at that time, who, as I mentioned earlier, actually used to live with Lawrence Harvey, and it's quite good because they get their famous scene where she goes nuts at him later on. When he was just a teenager and was first sort of navigating the acting world, and so they have this this past between them, and it's nice to see them come together here. She is the protective friend, and he is the young Lothario, and this kind of unspoken thing between them. And it's such a small role, but it's such a pivotal role for the film as well. It really lends a, an emotional depth, you know, because we get to feel later on Alice's rage, the death and everything through the character of Elspeth. So we'll see, we'll talk about that when she returns a little bit later on. Just wanted to talk about author John Brain, actually. He, the Room at the Top was his most successful work, even though he kept writing up until the 1970s. He had a real passion. He'd started off actually as a librarian in Leeds. So I guess Room at the Top is largely based somewhat on his own experience. But he did this documentary for BBC in the 1970s where he's just on camera sort of talking about his philosophy on life and his ethics and everything. It's very, very revealing. Although disconcertingly, he becomes somewhat conservative in his older age. 
and it didn't really chime with the angry young man, the, the sort of angry working class young man that, that had begun with Room at the Top. But he talked about ordinary people being the most extraordinary and he had a real connection to the North. He never wanted to leave. He did Well, he lived in London, but he never wanted to leave England because he felt that, you know, to truly write about a place, you need to be there and you need to be from there and you need to be really connected to it all the time. And so he talked about expatriates not really being able, you know, being able to see, you know, those things that you see when you're part of a community. So he talked a lot about community and this is what attracted him to write about Room at the Top because it is a story about community. It's a middle-class community and a man who tries to enter into that community. But he said that, you know, ordinary people are the most extraordinary because if you write about a bohemian, you know, the extraordinary is routine to them. But it's the normal people. They're the ones that have the most extraordinary stories because, you know, within the mundane, there's always something marvellous to be found in there. And so he was very, very drawn to talk about the North, to talk about the working class. And it was part of him, you know, part of who he was. And so, yeah, it's really interesting that it's, you know, that that passion to talk about the North then kind of kickstarts or helps to kickstart this wave where, as I mentioned, the North was really ignored outside of London and still to this day is kind of ignored in so many ways. And so to open that up and to show the North and to show it in such a, a, a great way as well was something quite revolutionary and something that people really responded to and thought was, you know, unique and new and fresh. I talk about this... I said about the new Irish lighting here. I mean, this scene is absolutely incredible. It starts off with the sex part, but then it slowly descends into jealousy and misogyny. And I mentioned earlier this film, you know, the misogyny that surrounds Alice, because even though Joe Lampton is the central character, I think, personally. And I think there are some people that would agree this really is Alice's story. I mean, Signa Rae just steals it from literally everyone. I mean, she's a great character in the book as well. And the dialogue in this scene is taken almost word for word from the book as well. But Simone Signa Rae, she had been in a period in her career that had kind of stalled. I mean, she'd worked with so many French greats, including this was not, too long after Clouseau, she did uh, Clouseau's Le Diabolique. She, but she was associated with the left. She had just been on the tour of Eastern Europe as well with her husband. She had signed a, a peace treaty pact against nuclear weapons and, you know, although was not an outright communist, she said she didn't totally believe in communists because of the sort of, you know, the, their lack of reverence for the arts. But she wasn't against them either. You know, she thought some of their ideas kind of jowled with her. She was very, you know, political and, and left-leaning. It kind of cut her off from a career in America because every time she tried to get, or producers had tried to get visas for it, it just fallen through because she was seen as persona, persona non grata, you know, too left-leaning, too possibly communist. She was going through a really difficult time and had been out of work for nine months. And she said she was 37 when she made this and was sort of in that middle ground as well where she wasn't young and glamorous and she wasn't really old and so she's kind of trapped in this this kind of middle ground of you know where do I go what do I do and of course Alice is just such a wonderful role for her and she called this like a watershed moment in her career she absolutely loved it won the Oscar for the role rightfully so uh the the stuff that cha is challenged in this scene though is incredible because I said the film can be or the story can be really misogynistic Joe Lampton objectifies women he, we talked about his grading system earlier on, and that's also something that comes from the book. Uh, but she, in this scene, she stands up to him and she calls out his double standard. And she says, I own my body and I'm not ashamed of it and I'm not ashamed of anything I've done. She calls out his misogyny. And so even the film exists where we have this misogynist who objectifies Susan as a status symbol.
you know, it's not particularly likable. He grades women by not just looks, but class and potential to future income and network opportunities. He's got a very illustrious system for grading women, whereas Alfie just sort of gives them numbers uh, based on looks, you know. He's got a whole social mobility scheme mapped out and would never touch so like lower class numbers. And he's a snob as well in, in, in a position where he doesn't really deserve to be a snob. And she calls him out, though. So I wouldn't say the film was or the story was misogynistic because it shows you the flaws in misogyny. And he comes up again. I think even in the, in the book, Alice is just such a shining light, such a powerful, empowered woman. And if we look at the time this was made, you know, before the sexual revolution, this is a woman who is explicitly frank about her body, about her sexuality. I mean, she's really up front. She doesn't lie. She doesn't play games. She goes against all this stereotype of the kind of femme fatale and the, you know, she's just very frank, very sexual, very open and very proud of who she is. And I think this is an incredible scene. And the way that she just stands in confrontation to him. And, well, he gets jealous that she was in new paintings. And he's got such a huge double standard. Like, he, he basically, in the book, one of the reasons he dumps Alice, and this is one of the big changes, is because he finds out she slept with Jack Wales. And he can't, his ego can't cope with it. Like I said, he's a lot more unlikable in the book. But he has this this double standard for himself that he can be promiscuous. He can carry on an affair. He can do what he wants, but he won't have this woman doing it. And she challenges him. She challenges him. She challenges his self-pity. She challenges this victim, the, how he sees himself as a victim, and he holds on to that. She calls him out as a coward as well. And I think... It's just such a such a powerful scene. There's been speculation, obviously, around why Simone Signore, and she said uh, it was initially attached, project was initially attached, obviously, to the other director, who had been caught in a, basically, Glenville had wanted her to play in a Hollywood film that he was doing and it really 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 had her on board for this role and she was like there's no point I won't get a visa and he's like no 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 we'll we'll sort it out and it doesn't get sorted out obviously this proves to be true and uh, Glenville had then been on board to film this and had wanted Signa Ray. and so he comes to France and says I've taken a detour I've come to see you he slams down the book which she admits she'd never heard of because it wasn't a thing in France so his dramatic effect was ruined but he's like read it so she does and uh, James Wolfe had then gone out there to who became a really good friend of hers and said, look, will you be in the film? And so she took it and he said, basically, we just have to ensure that the Ministry of Labour and the British Actors' Equity accept you. And because Signa Rae had had a good record in the film industry, like in 1953, she pointed out that they'd given me the highest award for cast door. And again in 1958 for The Crucible. And so that really won it for her and so she was allowed to pay Alice when she got the British Academy Award for the third time and so she said she loved the the British she loved the British film industry she was a real Anglo Anglo file because of it I love the way this scene plays out because as I mentioned earlier this breeding who are your people this may seem like a, a somewhat confusing scene to somebody who hasn't been in this situation. <laughs> but it's all to do with who you know and who you are connected to and, and who your family are, so a British class. And so his humiliation at this table comes from the fact that he doesn't know these people. 
and it becomes almost like a sport to them. And we see the Jack Wales character really, again, played by John Westbrook brilliantly. I mean, he's so disgusting. And Donald Wolfert is Mr. Brown, really emasculating this young man in a ritual humiliation toward, uh, in front of Susan, as if to say, look at this man. This is the man that you're interested in. Look at him. Look how pitiful he is. And he tries to play along and he tries to fit in, but he he loses it. He can't keep his cool because it is it's very cruel. I mean, look at the way and the way they dismiss him and the way they look at him. Uh, this is something that's also in the book. But again, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of it comes from his own paranoia and his own victim stance as well. But in the film, we can see why he feels this way, why he feels that, you know, he's, they're trying to say he's not good enough. Well, they, they're saying it. I mean, they're saying it without saying it. This, who, who are your people? Who do you know? Do you know so-and-so? Do you know so-and-so? And he's like, I don't know any of these people. And the way that he rejects the way they make money as well. And he's, and he, he's really cast out as an outsider. And I think this is the one, one of the things that lends emotional weight to this cinematic adaptation, an emotional weight that the book doesn't necessarily have. In the, within those moments, you can be with Joe Lampton standing in front of those grotesque, impolite people who've been so unwelcoming. And it helps you to overlook the other parts of his personality that are slightly more misguided or shallow. And then that former scene where he's at the bottom of the pile here, because he's been picked out as the outsider and therefore creating this star-crossed lovers situation, he's able to use that to his advantage. So he can be very manipulative as well. And that's what makes this such a complex narrative i think and what makes him such a, a complex character and i have to admit i find it really hard actually to be completely objective about joe lampton because i come into this as a working class person who has suffered from classism in the british class system and so i bring to that my own experience of that and so how I recognise certain things in this film, I realise are very personal to me and very connected to my own class experience. And I wonder how that much of that translates in sympathetic value to people come into this film that don't have that outlook, who haven't been criticised for the way that they talk, who haven't been you know the the scene earlier on when he's laughed at for mispronouncing a, a word is something that i've lived i've lived the scene where i've been in company where people are like do you know so and so and i felt very small because of that and that doesn't mean you know the i, I talked about joe lampton being very one-dimensional in in some aspects i think those people around him are also equally one-dimensional when we see those people of class they're obsessed with a certain status and they're obsessed with money and and keeping outsiders out and so, you know, it has a particular resonance for me, obviously had a particular resonance for a lot of British people at the time, as did a lot of those films in the in the new wave, because prior to that, we weren't hearing regional accents on screen, not in the way that people really talked. We weren't seeing those lives of everyday people and the things that they had to face. And so it opens up cinema to new possibilities. And as well as talking about those class possibilities that had previously been barred from cinematic discussion, it opens up British film to this sexual frankness that I touched on earlier in the commentary. And we see that specifically in this scene, I think, this idea that he's there 
almost trying to force himself on her. And there's a lot about this in the book about how she frustrates him. They have a lot of meetings like this and she turns him down. And in this one, she finally succumbs to him. We also have this idea that he actually gets it into his head in the book that he's going to knock her up, in his own words, if he has to, to be accepted by this Brown family, which is something that he isn't really on board with for the film. And I guess taking things out like, like that make him, like I said, more sympathetic. But there's a sexual frankness to the film that didn't exist in British film. And... You know, film in general was opening up to more adult narratives. 1959 in particular was a, was a real watershed year, 1959, 1960, where we have filmmakers in America really challenging the Hays Code. So 1959 was the year of Billy Wilde does Some Like It Hot, for example, with that wonderful part in line of Nobody's Perfect. And the all that is insinuated by that, and if you've seen that film, you'll know what I mean. Very, very transgressive. You also had 1959 was the year that Russ Myers, The Immoral Mr. T's, which was a new DQT, played a, th a theatrical run. And even though that's an independent film and it's outside of the mainstream, that was something that really kick-started really openly sexual films in American film. Otto Preminger's Anatomy of a Murder, a very, very morally ambiguous film as well. And, you know, so going back even from things like 1956's And God Created Woman, Bridget Bardot, this very primal, very sexualized new icon for French cinema, things were changing in cinema to kick back at the Hays Code and less than a decade later it would be gone. So this joins the ranks of those films that are, that are opening up those new possibilities and I find this scene in particular very, very interesting because just the openness of the language when she asks him, do I look different? You don't see them have sex, but the insinuation is, you know, she's talking about the loss of her virginity. And when you think about that, it's so frank, it's so open. At the time of, of this, the release of this, people found it quite shocking in a way. Not because of what you see, because you don't actually see a lot. There's no nudity. Everything is implied. But just the frankness and explicitness of some of the language is very direct in a way in talking about sex, in talking about sexual relationships. There's words like whore as well, which were considered very, very shocking. And the BBFC had a uh, problem with some of the language, but it's very forthright. It's very open in its language. And this is something that was challenging uh, prior you know, established traditions of bad language and narratives about sex. It's challenging it, openly challenging that. And this was something, you know, the sexual aspect and also having a French star as well. We know that like Alice in the book is originally was an English person. And with the casting of Simone Signore, though, and this is something that scholars of the film have speculated on, you're know, having a French actress in that role and the idea that ex certificates in Britain normally were attached to French films, which were seen as far more forward in terms of sex and gratuity. Having that sexual French star, you know, Simone Signore, the wolf's were really able to capitalise that on uh, on their selling and marketing of the film, a tale of savage lust. You know, they really... And the posters and the one sheets for the film were all about, you know, that central relationship with Signore. They're front and centre 
on this this idea of French free sexuality. And of course, what people get is something very, very different. They get an adult film, yes, and it does revolve around sex. And there are moments where that are incredibly sexy. And if you look at the chemistry between Signore and, and Lawrence, and a lot of it comes from her as well, and the way that they pass their cigarettes together and just the intensity that she has in this role. You can see why people were drawn to that, but then you also get all this other stuff in there and it doesn't really play out like a like a sexual story in terms of its graphic context. It's actually a very, very complex and adult, as in mature themes, dealing with things like moral ambiguity because there is so much moral ambiguity in this film that goes beyond the black and white of the Hays Code. It challenges people. We have flawed people here, and no one more flawed than the character of Joe Lampton. It gets the audience to question their own values as well because it puts you on the side of an adulteress. It makes Alice Aysgood a, you know, the true victim of the piece, even though... In Hollywood terms, she is the adulteress and therefore must be punished. You know, there's not really any moral in there. It's just about shades of grey and shades of nuance. And so it was a film that really, really challenged the established order in that way and was welcomed because of that. Simone Signore, actually, in her book, she talked about living the life of Alice A's girl. And how she felt that the role was a piece of wedding cake because it really turned her career around where she had been struggling to get into Hollywood because of her left-wing politics, which I've already mentioned. And she was floating around at a midpoint in her career wondering what to do with herself. She also felt very blessed because they had a very close everyone had apparently had a very close relationship on set. And she says in her book, the friendship and reciprocity between Jack Clayton and his cast grew and grew. Our working days in the studio ended as they had in Bradford. We separated with regret. We generally ended the day in a little pub where we had a snack before going to bed. I left my apartment in the Savoy about 5.30 in the morning, just as the maids began vacuuming the corridors. We'd have a little chat while I waited for the elevator. After a few days, I no longer had to wait. My friend, the night elevator man, knowing my hours, would be there waiting for me. He had six flights during which to continue exactly where he had left off, the story he had interrupted the day before. Everyone at the Savoy kept asking me whether I was pleased with my work. It must have showed on my face that I was. I was happy because I had a marvellous director. Without throwing his weight around and without pretentious explanations, he made us do exactly what he wanted. And as the rushes showed us, that he, that what he wanted was true and right and I was happy. Besides, I had a producer who wasn't a horse trader, but a man who loved cinema and respected the people who worked for him. And furthermore, my leading man about whom I had been told every possible variety of tale was someone I got along with very well. And I think you can totally see that closeness, that sense of closeness in the, in the scenes that Signore and Harvey have together. I mean, they're absolutely wonderful. And if you look at this, again, contrast to the book where he goes on holiday to the very idyllic Cornwall or Devon, I think it is, down southwest in England, and it's this beautiful seaside place. And he talks about it in those terms, almost like being a postcard, I guess, to contrast from the industrialised smog of the, the north. Whereas in this, it's which is probably more true to life, it's absolutely hammering down with rain, and they're there in these raincoats, and it's all very grim even though this is the, you know, one of the most potent love scenes of the whole film, because it's, it's, it's potent because you feel that intimacy between them. And I think 
the environment really helps that the fact that it's hammering down and the fact that they're naked as well in these coats it's such a little touch because there is talk in the book of nude sunbathing and then you hear it later again but they're just this shot of the feet so simple such a just a split second but it tells us everything we need to know that they're naked and they've been on that wet windy isolated beach naked and everything that that goes together with that then by contrast we get the bedroom scene where he's in his pajamas like i said everything is in the insinuation and i think this is one of the things that jack clayton does really well with his the innocence which he chose to do after this in 1961 which is in my mind one of the best british horror films of all time Nothing can beat it. An adaptation of Henry James's Turn of the Screw. There is a huge amount of veiled sexuality and innuendo and just in the ambiance of that film. And again, we have those two teaming up together, Jack Clayton and Freddie Francis on the cinematography. And it's so subtle, but it's just so potent. And we see that here as well with moments like the beach uh, I, don't know how I haven't really had a chance to talk about jack clayton i think he was an immense talent who made some incredibly interesting films especially if you consider the the three that he did room at the top the innocence and then the pumpkin eater 1964 which was written by harold pinter who was just incredible with Anne Bancroft is this housewife who's kind of disillusioned. He made just incredibly interesting films with so many of these little details and so much subtext and nuance in them. He wasn't prolific though, which is unfortunate, but a lot of that was to do with himself. He said he never made a film he didn't want to make following the he started off as a tea boy in the 30s and then worked his way up through up to editor and then cinematographer started working with the wolves made several short films and served as associate producer and in fact he'd produced uh, three films that starred Lawrence Harvey prior to this, so Three Men in a Boat from 1956, which had Harvey in the lead. He was associate producer on that. On Lewis Gilbert's The Good Die Young from 1954, which starred Lawrence Harvey and Gloria Graham and Richard Basehart. And 1956's I Am Camera, where he's played Christopher Isherwood in an adaptation next to Judy Harris's Sally Bowls, which was another ex certificate, a film that came up against the censors because of its depiction of adult themes, which was an adaptation of Isherwood's Berlin stories, which also became the basis for much later for Bob Fosse's Cabaret in 1972, where Harvey played Christopher Isherwood. So they had a relationship prior to this. But Clayton had this label. I mean, this is when, you know, this is his breakout film. It's hugely successful. It's nominated for Oscars. It wins to really gets the attention. And his career, I guess, stalled at certain times because he was known to be very choosy very selective about what he worked on but he was also labeled as difficult because i mean it's difficult to talk about jack clayton in terms of an author because by his own admission he really rallied against making the same film twice he wasn't interested in keep returning to the same themes over and over again but he wasn't exactly a journeyman either in that he wasn't one of those directors like i mentioned richard Fleiss, fleischer earlier with the with the vikings and the score for that 
He wasn't one of those sort of camera for hire guys who leapt from genre to genre. He had the visionary style of an auteur, but he was very, very choosy about doing things that were completely unique time and time again. And so I guess he he falls out of film scholar circles on that because they tend to stay apart from people like Neil Sinyard, who has studied him in depth, who tend to sort of stay away from characters like that that don't have these recurring themes or certain projects that they return to time and time again in this auteur mould. They, you know, so it makes him very difficult to analyse in those terms. But, for example, I mean, he could have been a, a huge voice in the British New Wave following this. He was offered Saturday night, Sunday morning in the owl-shaped room in Sons and Lovers, and he turned down all of them because he didn't want to just make another room at the top. He then chooses to do The Innocents, which, as I said, was an adaptation of a Victorian ghost story and all that associated with that. You know, technically a genre film. And so... He he becomes very, very difficult to classify. But because he would turn down these projects, I mean famously he turned down he turned down Alien was one of the things. Or he had a lot of projects that would kick off and then they wouldn't come to fruition. So another famous one was he was supposed to direct the tenant in the late 60s and that was something he was very 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 attached to but he was working on something else he's messing around and the producer thinks that he's got fed up and gives it to roman polanski which he was very very annoyed about because he was the one who had asked for the property and was sort of so he had a you know not a huge career but the films that he did make well not loads of films are all really really interesting room at the top the innocence the pumpkin eater our mother's house and then the great gaps in 1974 which is another film that talks about class something wicked this way comes in 1983 the lonely passion of judith hearn in 1987 and then memento mori in 1992 such a great talent though so it's a shame that he came against these obstacles i guess and some of them were obstacles within himself and others were just obstacles with the film industry in general because he had a, a real artistic i guess he, he had a, a real artistic value and he was somebody who was very principled and stuck to his principles and i think that's why his films are so interesting because he's fully engaged in whatever he's making 100 percent, and that's why you get so many of these little details and this just such subtlety and depth but at the same time you know it makes you sad when you look at the other projects he was attached to and the fact that they never came to fruition Coming back to Room at the Top, though, this was the golden period for Jack Clayton because following the release of this, he was really in demand. He'd gone from being an associate producer and working on shorts to being the new bright young thing, although he wasn't young. He was in his 40s. One thing that, that amuses me, actually, one quote from him from... Neil Simon's piece, Sex, Realism and Yorkshire Pudding, some reflections on the critical response of Room at the Top, is how Jack Clayton, who was interviewed at the time uh, in 1959 for the New York Post, like really disliked this label of angry, angry young man because he was a middle-aged man. And the quote that Signor provides said he thought the expression was a silly way of describing people who've always existed anyway and have not really got anything to do with the strictly current scene. And to go back to Signor's connection to great expectations, it's true. We, we've always had these angry or vengeful or, you know, characters who feel like they've been wronged. And so maybe it's not a new way uh, is not a new character and so he rejected that and that tells us a lot about 
what Jack Clayton thought about his position in the British New Wave, I think, because he wasn't somebody who was totally attached to the New Wave. He, he made this one film and he moved on. It shows us that he wasn't interested in the social commentary so much is, is just the story. And Sinyard actually said that the thing that really interested him was this idea of the post-war male coming back from war and the themes of the war, which... Uh, are quite understated in the film and you see a lot more of them in the book so you hear some of his war stories but we know enough in the film we know he was a POW we know that he considers himself something of a coward because he didn't have the money or influence to escape and so he just stayed where he was because he didn't want to be cannon fodder we know that much we know that he's lost his parents and that he's a somewhat rootless individual as a result he's somebody who's not tied to any family he's only got his aunt so i guess that's what makes him pushes him forward because he's somewhat rootless and these were the things that jack clayton was interested in the dynamic between these characters and the fact that it was just a very very human story about somebody trying to uh, somebody trying to survive and get ahead in in this environment this post-war britain and so that is what drew clayton to the narrative rather than any idea of like when we look at osborne and richardson you know they wanted to bring this very socially conscious commentary to British film and theatre. They wanted to change the landscape and open up these things. Jack Clayton wasn't particularly interested in that. He was more interested in the more timeless human elements of the story. And it is timeless in a way. It is something that can apply just as much today as it did then. So I think, I think that's another thing that... In people always recognise this film as such an important door opener for the new wave, and it was. Like I said, the fact that it was marketable and made a hell of a lot of money, two and a half million at the box office from a £280,000 budget, you know, opened the door for people like Richardson to come in with Saturday night, Sunday morning. And then we get to see the true... British New Wave with its documentary realism and its authentic accents. We're seeing actors who actually talk that way in real life, actors who've, who've, who've previously had to hide their accents but behind elocution lessons or receive pronunciation, which is the technical term for that very BBC accent that the English tend to be connected to. And they were coming out and, you know, it was very socially conscious and it was intended to kick up a storm and to open up different conversations about class and about life in Britain. And it was very critical of the establishment. But Jack Clayton was not the angry young man. He was a middle-aged man who was just interested in making an interesting film. And I find that point, that, that quote, you know quite funny because you know when you look at the other figures in the new wave they were a lot younger and a lot hungrier and a lot more driven and a lot more political john brain was very political though interestingly as i said when he came back later on and he does this this interview this documentary for the for the bbc he's become somewhat more conservative in his his way and you know he's in he's got fat with in middle age he's living in a lovely manor house in suffolk i think and he talks all about you know social order and stuff but also things like the importance of community and connection and things like that but he what you do get in this is it's interesting because uh and not to go on a huge random tan tangent about politics but I, it's something i see in this what you have with the working class people, and you see it in the 
ant. It's only a very small thing. It's this idea of the working class is sticking together and it's all very labour, left-wing orientated. The idea of the unions, the idea of industry, the idea of being a worker, so on and so forth. What Joe Lampton has is the self-sufficiency of the Conservatives because the Conservatives in there, the more right-leaning, are to do with less to do with social policy and the welfare state. They're to do with getting on. They're to do with moving forward. They're to do with everybody having a chance. Of course, in that there's the idea of everyone having the same starting block. So this film does open up that conversation about conservatism, self-efficiency, moving on. We don't generally have the same thing as the American dream. You know, anyone can make it. Britain isn't that sort of place. The working classes are generally, you know, from when you're born and when you go to school, you're told generally aspiration isn't for you. You're more suited to working in industry. You're more suited to working in minimum wage jobs or semi-skilled jobs. And there isn't the aspiration there. <clears throat> it was the Conservatives who brought along this idea of aspiration. And so Joe Lampton is, in a way, a very sort of a young conservative. Interestingly, in the sequel, we get to see he's become a conservative councillor, but feels the society is unfair. He, he, he criticises business practice in this. We saw his, earlier his talk of tally men. And he criticises that, he criticises the ruthless politics. But there's more of that in Life at the Top, where he is stuck as a Conservative councillor. But he still has some of his old Labour values, and he's all for social housing, and he's against corruption in business and politics. And so he's, he, he's a slightly more principled person in the sequel. Joining him for that, we have, obviously, uh, Heather Sears, who I haven't managed to talk about. Just starting out, she was actually in the story of Esther Costello, which was produced by James Wolfe before this, alongside Joan Crawford, where she plays this real innocent, blind girl in a, in a kind of noir thriller type thing about how she and her mother are semi-manipulated and I don't really want to give any spoilers for that, but she's such an innocent, innocent, innocent character in that. And so she's great for the role of Susan, who's supposed to be very wide-eyed and live this very sheltered life. Although we do see certain bits of manipulation in her and the way she's like, you won't see Alice again and you won't speak to her again, blah, blah, blah. So, So we see that. But Sears didn't return for the sequel. She was played by someone else. But we did have people like Ambrosine Philpotts, who plays Mrs Brown in this. She returned Donald Wolfitt as Mr Brown was back. And even the character of George A's girl, played by Alan Cuthbertson, was back in that as well. So some of the same characters. That was directed by Ted Kocheff. And didn't particularly have the critical acclaim of this original, but I find it an interesting film. And it's well directed as well because it gets to show you i guess you could say the argument could be well you don't need to see where he goes after this you know he's going to pay the price but he really hammers it home what's happened to him and he's haunted by the fact that he'll never see alice again here she is in her final scene i think this is i talked about an emotional resonance that the film has that the book really doesn't. In the book, there are a lot more shallow reasons why he ditches her. But there is one thing, and it's this fact that, you know, we know that he's a coward, and we know that he's an opportunist, and we know that he's out for himself. But also, when, you know, when you think about it, he doesn't have to be here. He doesn't have to go and tell... Alice. He doesn't have to go. He's a coward. His history should tell us that he would run away, just make a phone call. He'd, he'd, he'd avoid her. You know, if we look at how the the character started at the beginning, he would have just 
kind of hidden away and not said anything and sort of hidden his face and being the and being the coward but he doesn't do that here and it's it's these touches like this these changes from the book because he still goes to confront her in the book but there's all this jealousy and double standard again and the argument they have doesn't have the same resonance that the argument that they have here because you get the idea that you know he he believes that he can't support her and it's just going to be a disaster and there's this sort of sense of resignation to their own fates and you know george is on his back which is another thing that doesn't happen in the book he doesn't have that confrontation with the husband george he doesn't get the direct threat in fact the threat of george a's girl is just given as a throwaway comment from a friend you know what about george a's girl he could he could be difficult there could be a scandal there's no actual direct confrontation but in this he you know it shows that he cares about alice he can't support her he wants to avoid scandal and he just feels like it's the best all round. and so in a way he almost redeems himself from being a coward he redeems himself from his previous selfish motivation and it really becomes the punchline you know because we've seen his character develop over the course of the narrative from a very very shallow misogynist to somebody who has some sense of conviction and somebody who in some way is growing a backbone although not fully he and i think that's one of the most interesting things about how the narrative develops there is a, a development in joe lampton's character character arc in the book but it's different it doesn't have the same weight as it does in the film and i think this is one of the ways that the film becomes better than the book because you don't get joe lampton's shallow prattlings on about jack in fact jack wales isn't even mentioned i mean it seems such a ridiculous thing really because in the book he he sort of says well i might have gone back if i hadn't have heard heard this thing about jack wales it kind of clicks that something said that she he's not the first and he can't deal with that and this takes it way and beyond that and it brings it into something more adult and more mature and something in which you can really feel the pain of these two characters it's a very quiet scene as well considering all the passion and the desire and the love that we've seen previously it's a very quiet scene it's very understated and it's very very well played out obviously it's the last time we'll see Simone Signore after we'll see her in the pub in a minute and then she goes but it's it it's she said in her own book you know Alice even right up until the end because it's her death that then becomes the catalyst for everything else to fall apart we you know she never leaves the screen and so as I said earlier on she she you know she steals everything and it's i mean she was nominated for so many awards and it's not surprising that she won the oscar for this because she is truly just truly brilliantly but i particularly and i do love melodrama i have to admit that but i do particularly like the way that, that clayton avoids that melodrama and the grabbing and the pushing and the begging and the crying and the things that we normally see and she just turns her back and he walks away and we just see that door open and close and there's a finality to that i think that's one of the things where this does play into the new wave a recurrent theme that fills the new wave is this rather fatalistic idea of fate and destiny where people are stuck on the wrong tracks and no matter how hard they try to keep moving forward to get on the right track this fatalism drives them towards a doomed state or something they don't really want and you get this idea that people are just stuck on this track going round and round and round and able to get off and i think that's very true of this i mean some of that comes from and Signard has brought this up because prior to getting into directing 
Clayton was working with people like John Houston on things like Moulin Rouge. And Houston also had, and he said he learned a lot from Houston. Houston also, this touch of the head there. I'll talk about that in a minute. Houston also had this idea of these doomed, these heroic sort of missions that were doomed, you know, doomed to fail from the start. And and there's a similarity in that because even though Joe Lampton gets everything that he thought that he wanted, it turns out to be everything that he doesn't want. And so we get this sense by the end of the film that he's on a trajectory that he can't stop. He's stuck on the wrong tracks. He wants to get off. He wants to be with Alice, but there's nothing he can do. He's just stuck in the wrong place and he's forced to keep moving and moving and moving. We get that idea of fatalism that comes up in so much of the British New Wave and things like Some Kind of Loving, Saturday Night, Sunday Morning, The Taste of Honey. I mean, it recurs over and over again because... You know, if you don't have money and privilege and social class, you are pretty much limited to the tracks on which you're allowed to travel. So even though Joe Lampton skips the tracks and he gets ahead, they're not it's not on his own terms. And we then see that at life life at the top, where his dream of having so much power and blah blah blah, you know, is nothing. It's empty, it's it's shallow. And he's no longer the shallow person he was. And I think that's one important thing about the sequel. I find this scene one of the most potent. I talked earlier about some of the love scenes being potent. This is just incredible, this scene. The way that we learn about Alice's death. And originally they had thought to put the crash in this, but Clayton was quite clear that... He didn't want that. He wanted us to know about the death when Joe does. And the way it just comes like it's... Putting on the scales again there on the left. The way it comes just, you know, in the middle of this celebration and it's said at the side, it's almost like Fellini's Lestrada, where a character in that finds out about a death, almost like a throwaway comment, and then they're left to deal with the consequences. And it's the same thing here. They're opening the champagne, everyone's happy, and then in the foreground he's picking out these details and he's just like, what? And the way he just stops... And and the fact that no everyone's oblivious to this, the way he's holding that glass, he's just like, what the hell is going on? And it's one of those really, really nightmarish moments. And that's further enhanced by some of the close-ups of the faces and the way that the just the whole scene is composed. We saw when he heard the noise, those faces become very, very grotesque and very stylized. And he, it, Clayton actually uses a similar thing in in the Pumpkin Eater when um, the Anne Bancroft character is in a in an emotionally disturbing situation. These close up faces and everything becomes grotesque. He does it more in that because it's supposed to specify a certain mental condition but you see the seeds for that coming down in here and it's just such a truly powerful but very very subtle scene the way that it plays out so i wanted to go back to tony oldgate's piece actually on the censorship which i mentioned earlier he points out the the bbfc that the wolves had already come up against the bbfc because of am camera because it had a bro a broached or intended to broach the abortion theme and women of twilight in 1952 because it was based on sylvia raymond's controversial all women play about baby farming and unmarried mothers so they were not they were not a, a stranger to the ex certificate or with things coming up against the bbfc but as okay points out they had a lot of weight in the British film industry and one thing that they did do and John Trevelyan actually took over at the BBFC famous John Trevelyan he was somebody who had a sort of reverence for art film and 
would even defend things like Pasolini sallow on artistic terms, even though certain cuts would need to be made. And he was somebody who really had a an understanding of what adult cinema could represent. So he could be reasonable. He often wasn't when it came to things like Hammer Horror. But he did have this, this idea of, uh, you know being able to take nuance on the chin and so he'd only just come into the job and what most filmmakers would do was they would produce the script submit it to the bbfc for approval and changes before filming and the wolves didn't do this which oldgate suggests was slightly manipulative of them because it put the bbfc in a difficult position they'd already they presented the the film almost finished and this was a big risk for the wolf because if they demanded huge reshooting, it was going to cost a lot of money. But then there was also the fact that the wolves had some position of influence as well. And so the BBFC were kind of subjugated in a way, not fully, but they had issues with language, don't waste your lust, you're an educated and moral bitch, would, would change to time and witch. The car crash, there's a scene in the in the book where they talk about Alice being scalped and they wanted to leave that in, but the BBFC were like, no way. John Trevelyan wrote to the producers on the 13th of October and said, we still feel that the lurid descriptions of Alice's death are overdone and hope that some way can be found of reducing them. Most of the description is spoken off screen when Joe's head and shoulders alone are visible, so cutting should not be difficult. Incidentally, we all thought that some reduction in this verbal description would be an artistic improvement, but you may think differently. And John Wolfe replied and said, I must say I'm concerned that Alice's death in the film should not be toned down too much. Dramatically, it is, of course, terribly important, and I should have thought, too, that the fact that she met a violent end is morally right from a censorship point of view. As I mentioned to you, we had, at the time of shooting the scene... We had thought of shooting the scene, but then we decided against it. It certainly did not occur to us that just having it talked about by other characters would likely raise censorship problems. So I reached a compromise on that. This was the scene, though, it had to be altered and parts of it reshot because they needed, the BBFC demanded that there would be no ambiguity in there that insinuated that he'd had casual sex with this woman. And so that had to be altered but then john trevelyan actually sent out some he did some market research and sent out some of his examiners on the 22nd of january 1959 he sent an examiner out to the plaza cinema who reported balcony packs so stalls probably ditto on the whole a silent sensible audience of real adults not teddy boys but there was the inevitable odd burst of inane laughter at some of the more outspoken lines one man hurried out in the middle and said to the attendant at the balcony exit this is a disgusting film which made several people giggle i think the shock appeal of the film rests mainly on the personality of simone signore who always carries about her the climate of a sultry foreign ex to which the patrons of english speaking exes are not accustomed people were probably also interested to hear, hear the words whore bitch and bastard which still has the charm of novelty for a cinema going public the love making was certainly fairly hot for those were not accustomed to foreign exes but it looked to me fairly easy to defend i expect the film will produce a few cross letters in its passage around the provinces but there was nothing in it that i personally was surprised or worried to see or hear in an ex film and then he sent another examiner out on the 4th of february of the same year who said i saw this at the colton i should say that a packed house about 80 percent of the audience were people over 30 many from the provinces i have seldom seen an audience more gripped by or more sympathetic to any other British film except possibly Kwai and that was partly due to the extraordinary but unobtrusive realism of the photography and to a high standard in direction. Simone Signore's performance deserves an Oscar. She has never been so good. I'm not surprised that people have talked about the frankness of the dialogue, certainly the most adult we have ever allowed in a non-continental film, but I thought the visuals were discreet enough. 
It is interesting to note that after most of the tricky scenes, the seduction of Susan, there were little touches of wry or ironical humour which made the audience chuckle and helped to remove any shock or offence which the audience might have otherwise felt. I only heard one lot of female gasps. That was when Wolfit referred to Signore as an old whore. This, I think, was partly due to the unexpectedness of the remark and partly because I think most of the women in the audience were in so much sympathy for Signore's predicament. The board has done the right thing with this film, but I'm glad that we allowed the frankness and the visuals to go no further. How easy it would have been if all the tricky scripts were made by such a good technician team. So I think that sums it up, really. I mean, it was shocking, as I said at the time, but because of this emotional resonance, it, it passed itself up to a higher level i just to go back to that scalping thing and i mentioned signore touching her head in the mirror that was a like a visual reference to that which would have had more impact if you'd heard that she was scalped because it is really shocking when you read it in the book it's shocking to think you don't see it but you hear about it and it's just it's just not the sort of thing I mean, they still keep enough grisly details in to to really give it that punch the fact that she didn't die instantly the fact that she's crawling along the road what it does is changes the it changes the expectation because normally we're not supposed to sympathize with adulterers especially if they're women i mean that's something that women when you look at Hayes Code classic Hollywood are generally more punished for transgression in this field and although Alice is punished because she dies you still feel for her which is something that often within the Hayes Code you weren't supposed to feel for that that person that adulterer but because of the way that you know Clayton's skilled team approach this because of Signore's performance it becomes something else and it becomes something wonderfully morally ambiguous and human and real this part we're just getting to the end now isn't in the book it ends with him being picked up out of the gutter and we don't see where he goes until the sequel but it, it, it's a good little punchline, really. The fact that he stood there with his dream wedding and his new father-in-law and his prospects and his friend Charlie looking very, very smug. And he looks like he just wants to die. <laughs> and uh, he's just so subversive in his own way because it just totally rejects this idea of the romantic happy ending. It just totally throws that out of the window and gives a massive F you to everything that that stands for. And I didn't mention Hermione badly, the way that she really goes at uh, Joe Lampton. Uh, Lawrence Harvey is just amazing. We see her at the back of the church kind of looking on and judging and he has to live and there she is. And she's just wonderful in the way that she attacked him in the previous scene. I mean, it just really is that punchline. It's that punch to the gut, really. You get your new life, but at what price? What has it cost you? And it's it's cost him everything. It's cost him Alice, the person that he could truly be himself with, which is something I didn't really get a chance to talk about, but he could be truly free and truly himself with this woman, and now he is left. That look, you know, the a slight worry on his friend's face. And then they're kind of like, we'll just keep smiling and he just drives away. You know, he's given all that up to just play out this facade, this shallow, shallow, shallow facade. And, you know, it's totally in contrast to these so-called happy images of celebration. I think it's wonderful. I think Room of the Top is just such an incredible film for British cinema. It's something that still has resonance today, and such an in, just just such a groundbreaking film, and so beautiful on this new restoration as well by Kino. So all that leaves me to say is, if you've stayed with me until the end, thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this commentary. <laughs>